But if the settlements are illegal, then Israel has no right. And the reason it has no right is because of this principle in law. It's a fancy Latin term, and I don't have uh, Mr. Marx's command of Latin, so I'll use the English translation. The term is, you can't get a right from a wrong. You can't get a right from a wrong. I know this, this woman here, she can't quite understand what that means. All it means is this, if the settlements are wrong to begin with, then you can't have a right to protect them. You can have a right to pack up your bags and leave, but you don't have a right to protect something which in the first place is wrong. If it's illegal to begin with, then you don't have a right to protect it. So, the court had to decide, are these settlements legal? And number three, the wall happens to cut right through East Jerusalem, so that Israel keeps lots and lots of Jews on their side of the wall, and as few Arabs as they can, and on the other side of the wall, they put lots and lots of Arabs. And so the court had to decide, to whom does East Jerusalem belong? If East Jerusalem belongs to Israel, of course it has the right to build a wall in East Jerusalem. But if it belongs to the Palestinians, obviously they have no right. So what happens? The court deliberates, it hears evidence, and it reaches the following conclusion. It's illegal to acquire territory by war, so Israel has no right to any of the West Bank or any of Gaza. And Israel and the court calls all of the West Bank and all of Gaza, they call it occupied Palestinian territory. And the abbreviation is OPT. So if you look at human rights reports, they often refer to OPT, Occupied Palestinian <coughs> Territory. They are using the phrases, the terms of the International Court of Justice. Number two, the court says, of course the settlements are illegal. Because under Article 49 of the Fourth Geneva Convention, it's illegal for an occupying power to transfer its population to occupied territory. Israel is the occupying power. It's transferring Jews to the West Bank, previously also to Gaza. That's clearly in violation of the Geneva Convention. The settlements are illegal. Number three, East Jerusalem. Well, the court says, East Jerusalem was acquired exactly the same way as the West Bank and Gaza. East Jerusalem, and the court is very clear, is occupied Palestinian territory. So, on three of the four controversial questions, the court decides. But now, again, you have to bring to bear your computational skills, your arithmetic ability, and judge for yourself, was it controversial? The vote in the court was 14 to 1. 14 to 1. The only negative vote was cast by the American, Thomas Bergenthal. And even Mr. Bergenthal said in his statement, he said, I agree with a lot of what the majority said. And then he made a very crucial statement. Because as everyone understands, the whole issue are those settlements. If Israel can't build settlements, well, it doesn't want the West Bank for its scenic value. 
It wants it for its water, for its uh, agricultural, uh, fertile agricultural soil. So the key question is the settlements. And Mr. Bergenthal says, on the question of the settlements, paragraph six of article 49 of the fourth Geneva Convention does not admit for exception on grounds of military or security interests. I agree that this, this provision applies to the Israeli settlements in the West Bank. All 15 judges, all 15 judges agree. And the reason is fairly obvious. The reason is because on these particular issues, an inadmissibility of acquiring territory by war, so, uh, uh, transferring populations to occupy territory, these are basic principles of international law. They are not controversial at all. And that's one of the peculiarities of the Israel-Palestine conflict. If you look at the actual issues at stake, they are probably the least controversial in international law of any conflict in the world today. The last issue, which I haven't uh, fully discussed, is the question of the right of return. For those of you who are not familiar with it, just briefly, when Israel was founded in 1948, about 750,000 Palestinians at the end of the war found themselves outside their homes. Many live in refugee camps in the West Bank, in Gaza, in Lebanon, in Jordan, and most of you will know the reference to the Palestinian refugees. And what is their legal status under international law? That's the fourth issue, borders, settlements, Jerusalem, refugees. As I already mentioned, every year in the UN General Assembly, the resolution to resolve the conflict includes, includes the principle that the Palestinians have the right to return to their homes in compensation. It's also true, it will come as a surprise to many of you, all the major human rights organizations have upheld the right of the Palestinians to return to their homes. Human Rights Watch, in 2000, it said, we urge Israel to recognize the right to return for those Palestinians and their descendants who fled from territory that is now within the state of Israel and who have maintained appropriate links with that territory. Amnesty International, 2001. We call for Palestinians who fled or were expelled from Israel, the West Bank, or Gaza Strip, along with those of their descendants who have maintained genuine links with the area to be able to exercise their right of return. And so what you find is, on all the major questions, borders, settlements, Jerusalem, refugees, there's no dispute in the international community. And now that just leaves us with one question. I've gone through the position of all the states in the world, including the Arab states and the Muslim states. It's clear from the record that the only obstacle is Israel and the Palestinian, excuse me, Israel and the United States at the level of states. But what about the Palestinian parties to the conflict. There's no dispute at all, I would underline at all, that the Palestinian Authority, currently represented by Mr. Abbas, that he formally supports the two-state settlement, and that in fact the Palestinian Authority has made major concessions beyond what the international law requires of them. But there is this question of Hamas, 
which seems to, I don't know, press strange buttons in people. So what is Hamas's actual position? Before I get to it, I would want to make the obvious point that Hamas was only elected into power in January 2006. The Palestine Liberation Organization already, from the mid-1970s, was supporting a two-state settlement on the terms we already went over. So it doesn't seem believable, or it can't be understood, that Hamas is the obstacle to a resolution of the conflict when Israel had from the mid-1970s until 2006, 